So we are so excited to welcome Music at Menlo to Google today. Um, every summer since 2003, Music at Menlo has featured some of the world's greatest chamber musicians right in our own backyard in Menlo Park. In the Silicon Valley tradition, Music at Menlo takes an innovative approach to the Summer Music Festival. Unique programming and intimate settings allow the audience members to immerse themselves in the music. And this year is no different. The theme is Through Brahms. As you might imagine, all of the concerts feature works by Johannes Brahms, which is one of the greatest chamber music composers out there. But beyond that, the programs also feature pieces that were inspired by or inspired Brahms himself, helping to shine a new light on these great works while introducing audience members to some less familiar composers. Today, we have the special treat of getting our own Through Brahms concert. We'll hear two works by Brahms himself, and then two pieces, or then pieces by two composers who followed him, Enescu, one of my personal favorites, and the American composer John Harbison. So with that, I will turn it over to Wu Han, who is the co-artistic director at Music at Menlo. Thank Welcome. You. In real life, I'm not an administrator. I'm actually a pianist, which you probably would discover in the first piece. But um, my husband and I, uh, my husband is David Finkel from the Emerson Quartet. Um, we were looking for a project that is sort of experimental. So we found Silicon Valley fascinating. And I have to tell you, eight years ago when we came here, they said, you guys are crazy. Who wants to hear chamber music in Silicon Valley? And I said, I just don't believe in that. I really believe in the spirit of learning, exploration. And I, if nobody show up, I will bring all the musicians, which uh, it's about 100 of us. We will just gather and do our own thing and have lots of fun and hope somebody will show up. And what happened is we had a five years business plan in the very first season, we will hit 98% capacity. I knew I have something. I knew I came to a place is correct. People are just excited about learning. So that's a, in a nutshell, um, the project has been incredibly successful, has been re reported from Wall Street Journal, New York Times and blah, 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 and the TV and stuff like that. That's not so interesting. The interesting part is we started a project totally backwards, not like the traditional model. The traditional model of the festival is you start a concert in your living room, and once you have about 80 people, you move to a church, and on the third year, you have three concerts. On the fifth year, you make a CD, and on the 10th year, you have more money, and you add education components, and maybe the radio notice you, and they will you know, broadcast. From the very first day of Menlo, it's just opposite. We have high class concert presentation, we have education components, we have a lecture series, we have a recording label, we have a radio series, we have a free concert for the public. We just went all out and hope everybody enjoys it. And it's been a blast for all of us. Um, I just take two examples. The radio series has developed in the last, last nine years. Now the listening ship domestically is four million, internationally is six million. Uh, that's from all the concert broadcasts. So I'm very glad Google now is in our portfolio. <laughs> now let's just take the uh, recording label. So far we have 47 CDs from the last nine years. It was recorded by this Grammy winning producer, Da Hong Si Chu, who also produced Emerson Quartet, Bozart Trio, all the superstars of the uh, chamber music world. So that's a sort of a snapshot of each project. We also have a very successful internship program. We're training the administrators of the next generation as well. That's also from the very first year. The theme of the festival is always chamber music. The good thing about chamber music is there's no boss that we can all contribute. Every one of us are leaders, are supporters, we're team players. We don't really listen to anybody. Uh, and so that makes the chemistry fascinating on stage. We need conversation. We need to interact with each other. We need to play our solo lines so strong that everybody want to jump off the seats, including your partner. Uh, when your partner is doing that, you want to be supportive. And it's just really one of those art forms that I treasure. And I think it's the best tool for education. We also, another character of the music at Menlo, it's really uh, thematic programming, meaning every piece is handpicked 
for some purpose to give you a contextual information. So for that, we're going to delve into Brahms, and I'm going to hand the mic over to Patrick Castillo. Um, I have to tell you, Patrick has been with me for nine years. He knows this festival inside out. He started out when he was 21. Right, Patrick, you are 30 now. Darn. <laughs> so Patrick will introduce the music. As you could tell, the festival spirit is pretty exploratory. It's a bit funky. It's unlike a regular chamber music concert. The whole festival is run in incredible high energy and with lots of fun. So I invite you all to join me. If you call the boss office and mention you're the Google people, they will treat you very well. I can promise that. So Patrick, can you help us to, you're the one formed this particular program. Can you help us to explain or learn something? I'll do my best. Uh, well, I'll just add a little bit to what Wuhan said, as she mentioned. Um, our approach at Music at Menlo to presenting chamber music is not just to put on a series of concerts and invite you to have a good time, but more than that, to present the repertoire in context and to, uh, to encourage uh, a spirit of learning and a spirit of musical discovery and, and uh, sort of exploring what makes the piece of music tick. And so in that spirit, um, as you've already heard, the theme for our festival this season is through Brahms. So we're going to be hearing, as you've heard, some music by Brahms, as well as a couple of other composers. So to help contextualize this, um, I don't know how many of you have a background in classical music. So for the benefit of any who might not, um, I'll start by giving you a general overview of the history of Western music from 1650 to the present day. <laughs> and I'll try to do it in about 90 seconds. So when we begin around 1650, we're in what's the Baroque era. So Bach, Vivaldi, a lot of very familiar composers, composers who influenced Brahms very heavily. So music like the Four Seasons, which is immediately familiar to everybody, that's from the Baroque period. Following the Baroque period, we arrive in the Classical period, Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, and uh, all of those greatest hits composers as well. And following the classical period, we enter the romantic period, the kind of heart on my sleeve, I'm so deeply in love with you and it makes me want to kill myself era of music. And, uh, and that's where we are with Johannes Brahms. So the things to listen for in Johannes Brahms as characteristic of romanticism, just overwhelming pathos, deep desperation followed immediately by the most exhilarated, ecstatic heights that you can imagine in music, and just butted up against each other without warning. And what we're gonna hear is not only the emotive expressivity of Brahms's music, but not only that he, uh, he absorbed the tradition of the Baroque and classical composers, but more to the point for this morning's program, how he influenced strands of modernism in the 20th century where in music, as in other art forms, uh, the landscape opens way up for a kind of aesthetic free-for-all. You have the traditionalists, you have the, the more cutting-edge avant-garde composers, but the idea that we're exploring uh, this season at Menlo is that through Brahms, all of these different strands of music are of a piece, that they all reference each other in a very uh, specific way. So with that, let's hear some music. Please welcome back to the stage, pianist Wu Han, and one of the most explosive violinists around, <laughs> Arno Sussman, who will be performing for you the FAE Scherzo of Johannes Brahms. <laughs>
Is it better if I hang out up here? We're gonna, gonna give the piano a chance to catch its breath. And uh, I'll take the opportunity to let you know a little bit more uh, about the festival. If one day you have uh, the time and inclination to spend more than 90 seconds learning about uh, what makes music go, I hope you'll pay us a visit because we try to offer as many opportunities as we can for uh, any listener, whether you're a newcomer or have been taking piano lessons for 25 years. Uh, something new to discover. Uh, we have a series that we call the Encounter Series, which is an evening-length multimedia lecture series that's in, uh, presented in conjunction with our concerts. If you buy a ticket to any of our concerts, you get in CD or MP3 form as you choose a pre-concert listener's guide uh, called Audio Notes that basically takes you through the music that you'll hear in the concert, replete with musical examples and conversations with uh, the performers and when they are available to us, the composers as well. Um, so, for example, if you'd like to know what FAE stands for, uh, you have to come visit us on our campus. 
And uh, with that, okay. <laughs> FAE stands for Frei aber einsam, German for free but lonely, which was a very romantic sounding motto for one of Brahms's close friends, uh, the violinist Josef Joachim, for whom the FAE scherzo was composed. And FAE, those three notes, became a kind of musical motto for Joachim as well. And so Brahms and two other composers very close to Joachim uh, collaborated on a four-movement sonata. Each movement was based on that motto. So it's good listening. I recommend it to you highly. Uh, next, please welcome to the stage another phenomenal young artist and, uh, like Arno, a recipient of the prestigious Avery Fisher Career Grant. This is pianist Alessio Bax, who will play for us Another short work by Brahms, one of his Opus 10 ballads, and in the true spirit of romanticism, it's a work inspired by a story of patricide. With that, Alessio Bax.
one of the things about Brahms' music that we've been exploring very heavily uh, at the festival this summer is his craftsmanship. One of the things that really sets him apart is his airtight uh, technique. And one of the things that uh, you might have noticed in this work is how certain very simple rhythmic gestures, like in the left hand of the piano, this yatatatam, yatatatam gesture, how Brahms sort of expanding on that weaves a very uh, exotic tapestry uh, just based on very simple motifs. And that's something that recurs throughout his music, how very, very simple gestures, a great composer is able to do so many things with it, coax so many uh, emotional, uh, emotional extremes using just one very simple gesture. We're going to find a, 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 a kindred spirit now in John Harbison, an American composer still with us. Uh, we're going to hear John Harbison's Piano Quintet. This is a piece composed in 1981. And uh, this is a piece that I think complements our Brahms offerings this summer very well because it sort of shows, again, the musical DNA of Brahms and how that tradition uh, extends very much into our own time and makes us a very dynamic art form. Uh, John Harbison is a composer who occupies a very different sound world from Brahms. You're going to hear that his melodic language, his harmonic vocabulary, just the way that the music sounds uh, is light years away from the music of Brahms. And yet at the same time, there's something about the construction, about the insistence of, of, the, uh, of the structural efficiency of every single note that harkens very much back to the uh, to the craftsmanship of the classical and romantic composers, and maybe uh, at its most extreme, the music of Johannes Brahms. I'm going to be joined now on stage by pianist Lucille Chung, violinists Ian Swenson and Georgia Flizanis, Yura Lee now wielding her viola, and cellist Lawrence Lesser. Oh, we're going to hear uh, the central three movements of what is a five movement work. And also, uh, as a PS, Georgia on the way over here offered a bottle of wine for anybody who can help her unlock her droid. Yeah. So. I need help. <laughs> I need help, okay? If you like what I play, how I play, come to me at the end. <laughs> and uh, sorry, one, one, one more thing. Following the performance, I understand we're going to have a little bit of Q&A on stage. So if there's anything you would like to ask of uh, Wuhan or myself or any of the performers, uh, you'll have your shot at us. I, um, I think it's worth mentioning the names of these movements. Oh, would you please? I don't have okay. the score. Okay. Okay. Um, this is these three inner movements of this work are, I would call them character pieces, in that they touch on a kind of almost very Brahmsian idea of pieces that evoke some particular. Um, atmospheric um, behavior. The first one's called Capriccio, and it is sort of a, an interesting little frou-frou in the middle of a very first serious, the first one was quite serious, but the next one was really like a throw-off, very humorous, and with an intersection that deals with the two doubles of instruments, the cello, the viola, and then the two violins, this sort of very sweeping, almost like an airborne aerial section of free form and free floating. Then it goes to an intermezzo, which was, of course, one of Brahms's most, I think, beloved um, categories of piano repertory that he wrote, such beautiful intermezzi. Then it ends with, um, of these three groups, a movement called Burletta, which always looks like bruschetta when we look at this. Um, <laughs> so as musicians, we're always relating to food at any chance we can. And this is actually an old 18th century form of comic farcical opera. And it is sort of a buffoonish. Uh, sort of music, intended to be humorous, intended to be guffawish. So please uh, indulge in realizing how guffawish we are going to be here today for you. <laughs> oh, hold on. This is very close to me. Uh, well, all right, I'll just relate.
So if I can invite all of my colleagues as well as Wuhan back to the stage. Um, and if there are any questions, we will field them at this time. Chamber music party. Awesome! So you have a lot of players here. Cello? Piano? Wow, cheers! <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Um, do you guys know the Harbison Quintet? Any one of you heard that before? One. Fantastic. How about Nisco Sonata? No. That's isn't that amazing? Those pieces should be played much more often, isn't it? They're incredible. And you're supposed to ask me a question. Why am I asking you a question? <laughs> well, one thing I noticed, that's the way we set the program. Even from the very first one, the Brahms, it was a ya da da dum bum ba bum and then it comes at the Brahms in intermezzo, uh, in the ballad, and then all these da dum bum ba da dum it's all motific music. And that's why I made the structure so important. It's like building a brick, building a house, one brick at a time to build. Yeah, that's, I mean, building a house. <laughs> <laughs> so any question about music and mellow? Yes? Mm -hmm. Thank you for the wonderful performance. Oh, thank um, you. One thing I found really interesting is watching the performers kind of glancing at each other during, you know, during the piece. Uh, what, what can you teach us about the way that performers communicate uh, with each other? Uh, the thing that we love about chamber music is that we're a team and that we don't control the whole thing. We share and we depend upon our colleagues to save us when we need saving. And we lend a hand when we can too. But basically the whole idea of our enterprise is that by working together like all of you folks, we're working for a very big purpose and we each have a role to play. And if we do it well, the whole thing turns out well. And that's from cooperating. Queuing. Yeah, I, I, I just want to take note that that last piece was not performed in this configuration last night. We are doing it because we don't have enough space on this little platform to sit in front of the piano in a normal way. So what we had to do here today is actually very evocative to the question that you just asked because we were suddenly sitting behind the piano, up high, the communication uh, trajectory of the normal setup is such that one doesn't have to think as hard as we had to today to be in different spatial relationships and in different audio relationships. Obviously, we change rooms all the time, so that's not a, a big variable to be discussed here. But in any case, I found it fascinating. I do, and there's, there's got to be a study to be done on the oral um, reaction response and then integration of that information at lightning speed. Because I, I have to say that I know that computers are great. I love them, okay? <laughs> but I think that what's going on mentally in a chamber music uh, context, and, and let's not even talk about orchestras because that's a whole other deal which I've lived most of my life in. But I've been a chamber music musician all my life as well. And I find that the synapses and the connections that are required to do what we just did here for you in this weird setup is worth study. And <laughs> Would you guys, some, one of you, do something for me on this, <laughs> as well as help me figure my droid out? <laughs> well, actually, what you're observing, it's, we call them queuing. So when one gives a great cue, it comes with tremendous amount of uh, beat, indication of the pause, and the indication of the feeling. It's no different than a conductor, right? Like Georgia, when you do the um, last movement, how do you cue that? We know how that movement goes, but there's silence right before we start. And if I'm thinking the pulse, dung, dung, dung. So I get everybody's attention and there's a fraught, taut moment when there's silence. Everybody's watching me and I give the cue from mm. So I give it and one. And that gives basically two beats. That's all the information you need. And what basically conductors do, they just basically give you and one. That's the sort of law of the, of the cue is a mm, boom, or just yeah, it's and establishing, one. Establishing pause. And the, it, that's a different than when, when you're you give the beginning of the intermezzo. If I'm doing this, you know you have to play tender, right? I have one small thing I'd like to add about, Go for it. <laughs> about how we signal to one another. 
And that's something uh, you folks may know about already or may want to pick up on. Um, if I want to take a signal from somebody, I never look straight at them <laughs> because by the time I process what I see and get it to move to my muscles, it's too late. So what I have learned to do is to look out of the corner of my eyes so that I pick up the whole sense of the motion of the person who's giving the signal, which is much more immediate to my muscles than if I'm looking directly at the person. I don't know whether anybody else feels that, but that's that's very, it's Fantastic. interesting. So you folks go to work on it and you can explain it all to <laughs> us. Any other questions? Yes. Just going to repeat the question for the uh, online viewers. The question is, uh, how much time our artists spend rehearsing together on this repertoire? As much as we can find, but it's not very much. We're supposed to arrive knowing the pieces that we're going to play so that the time that we do have, which is precious, is worked on is spent putting things together. Uh, we had only uh, three or four rehearsals for the uh, for the uh, Harbison piece, and uh, it's pretty thorny to get it together. If we do our job really well, you won't know that we had to do any work, but we <laughs> sure knew. But in general, in the professional situation, or like an orchestra, you will have two to three rehearsal each one, two to three hours, and you're on stage. So you pretty much have to come incredibly prepared. And in the chamber music situation, because you don't have a conductor beating the beat in the front of us, you actually have to not only know your part, you have to know everybody's part. So it's not like you go to an orchestra, you're a clarinet player, you just count on the conductor. For us, if you're for a piano quintet, we have to learn everything so you can respond very quickly. So it trained all of us in a different level of alertness at all time. Right? <laughs> yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Is there any other question for us? We look forward to see you at Music in Menlo then. Thank you so much. Thank you.